Recruitment and Admissions, and welcome to our presentation. So that we know um, where you guys are located, in the chat option box or the chat box, would you mind telling me your geographic location? So Rebecca is in Florida. We're in Florida. And Davy, wow, <laughs> very close to us, wonderful. Okay, in Virginia, wonderful, welcome. Um, we are excited that you guys are here. So we're going to go ahead and start our presentation. Uh, just bear with me one second. Welcome. So we're excited that you're here um, and we have a fantastic uh, presentation to share with you. Um, Chad Waxman, who has a doctorate in psychology, will be talking to us about competency evaluation and training. Uh, and so he will be uh, explaining the topic to you and will be available at the end of the presentation for uh, any questions. Um, so today, our present presenters today are Dr. Uh, Chad Waxman, uh, Dr. James Pan, uh, and Gregory Gale. Uh, as I said, I'm the Director of Recruitment and Admissions uh, in the College of Psychology at Nova Southeastern University. Um, so with that said, um, we're going to, I'm going to introduce to you or have Dr. Chadman uh, take over the presentation. Okay, great. Let me just get my camera up and running here. Okay. All right. So can everybody see uh, the PowerPoint on your screen? <laughs> I hope so. All right. So let me get started. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Waxman. Uh, I'm a adjunct instructor at Nova Southeastern University. I'm also a forensic psychologist um, for a competency restoration program uh, in the jail setting, um, which is very unique, very interesting. Um, it's starting to kind of happen more and more around the country. Um, and so that experience is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I teach some courses um, in the uh, master's program in forensic psychology as well as the um, Criminal Justice Institute um, as well uh, for Nova Southeast University. Um, a little bit more about me, um, just you know, so you all know, I also do VA disability evaluations. I do forensic evaluations um, in, in general, um, more, more criminal but sometimes civil. Um, and I've had experiences in a, in a lot of different settings, um, whether it's juvenile detention or in a jail setting or even a prison setting I've worked, uh, federal, state, uh, county. Um, I've, I've had a lot of different experiences in that way. Um, and I've also worked with a lot of different kinds of people. I've worked did in-home therapy with juveniles and their families. So, I have uh, a lot of different perspectives from um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, different populations of people as well as settings, uh, whether it's in the community or in an incarcerated setting. Um, so today's topic, we're going to talk a little bit about competency and you know why it's important. Okay, um, you know there wasn't it wasn't that long ago when people would go to court and uh, they would um, not really know what was going on because of a mental illness and. The attorney said, you know, just kind of be quiet and, you know, we'll, we'll get you a good deal and kind of move forward. Um, you know, as, as you might imagine, that, that, that doesn't sound right. Um, and so uh, the Supreme Court uh, weighed on this with the Dusky Standard, which we'll talk about, um, and then some uh, follow-up legislation. But the big thing is that competency, um, it protects the due process uh, of an individual defendant. It's not really fair that an individual can't understand the factual and rational pieces of the law as well as to be able to uh, prepare and execute their defense uh, because of their mental illness. Um, the big thing I want to stress is that it doesn't have anything to do with their willingness, but more their ability. And so, for instance, you know, if an individual has a personality disorder, like antisocial personality disorder, or if they're just, you know, not, not having it, <laughs> um, that's not enough uh, for competency. Um, what competency means is that they don't have the ability 
to, for instance, assist their attorney, not that they don't feel like working with their attorney. That, that's a little bit different. Um, so a couple of key things for competency that psychiatric diagnosis does not mean that somebody's incompetent. There are many people who I've been able to help restore in our program uh, who still battle uh, and deal with mental illness um, and symptoms of mental illness, even though they're maybe medicated or doing much better. Um, but because they're meeting the, the law's criteria for what competency means, they're, they're competent to proceed. Um, another thing is that even if somebody's improving clinically, doesn't mean they're competent. I've had many individuals who've done, who are doing very well, um, but they're still not there yet as far as competency. Um, the focus is on how the symptoms of their mental illness affect their ability to work with their attorney, behave, testify relevantly, um, make, de make decisions, and be able to understand what's going on around them. Um, the other piece to competency is it's a fluid concept. And so individuals can be competent one day and incompetent the next day, uh, if you really think of it, and sometimes by hour, uh, depending on how they're doing and, and when they're being assessed. Um, very interesting, I saw uh, an evaluation by three different psychologists where uh, two thought the person was competent and one was incompetent. Um, and I remember at the time I was a student and I asked my professor, um, it doesn't make any sense <laughs> to me. Uh, how, how could that be possible? How could you know professionals disagree like this? Um, and they said they're, they're probably all right. It was just they evaluated on a different day. Uh, so that was an eye-opening for me. Um, so again, it came about in 1960, the uh, Dusky Standard. Um, and basically, uh, kind of what we're, we're saying is that an individual has to have a factual and rational uh, understanding of the law and be able to assist their attorney on uh, that mental illness isn't interfering with those things. Uh, many states have adopted it, um, and um, Florida and Colorado uh, have, have adopted that standard, and they just kind of make it um, uh, to, to uh, meet their needs. Uh, the reason why I bring up Colorado is because that's where I work. I work in a competency restoration program in the state of Colorado. Um, so uh, another uh, court case that came up after that is uh, Godinez versus uh, Moran, and basically what that said is that if an individual is competent for one thing, they're competent for all, and just wanted to kind of bring that up. Um, as that competency by the Supreme Court is kind of seen as a, um, a thing that um, is competent for all aspects of the court system. Um, psychologists would probably disagree that, um, that there's different levels of ability needed in different aspects of the court. So for instance, going pro se, which is a fancy legal term for defending oneself, um, you'd imagine a person has to have a lot more of an ability to be able to do that uh, than an individual um, uh, who's not going to um, um, being their own attorney. Uh, but the Supreme Court didn't see it that way. Um, this is for your own reading. Um, you know, you, you all have uh, uh, access to the slides, and I don't want to, you know, re read out the statutes to you. But it just kind of gives you an example of the different uh, uh, two different states um, to get to get a sense. And you can always look up uh, if you're in a different state. I think uh, one of you are from uh, Virginia, if, if I remember, um, and. Um, you can look up the statutes uh, very easily. Just look up competency statute in Virginia or something like that. Um, what's interesting about Florida, actually, is that there's six prongs uh, that one has to meet. Uh, it's very specific. And I've seen it done in court where um, the judge will ask or the DA or the uh, defense attorney will ask about all the different prongs and they'll comment on each prong individual. I, I think it's actually very, uh, very good. I, I like the way Florida does it uh, a lot. Um, and so these are kind of rhetorical questions, but you know, what, what would go into a competency evaluation? And um, you know, is it difficult to do a psychological assessment utilizing a statute, meaning a law, right? Um, psychology uh, and, and the law and that intersection is really interesting because the law is seen as black and white and psychology is kind of seen as like fluid and, um, and, and ever changing. And so it's really difficult to kind of put those pieces together, and that's what the job of a forensic mental health professional is. Um, so whenever one is doing an actual, and, and just so you know, we're going to talk a little bit about assessment, and then we'll talk about what you do as far as treatment. Uh, that's kind of uh, the rest of our uh, 20 minutes time we'll be speaking. Um, the first thing is that you're going to want to tell the person why you're there, right? Um, that there's potential lack of confidentiality, um, that uh, that is a potential uh, incrimination. Um, so in Colorado, for instance, there's a statute specific uh, that states that an individual cannot incriminate themselves during a competency evaluation and treatment, which makes it nice because then you can ask about their understanding of the case without worrying about them incriminating themselves. Um, 
The next piece that you're going to want to look at for a competency evaluation is collateral. And that goes for all types of forensic assessment. Uh, collateral is really, really important. And it's not saying that an individual is always lying or that you cannot believe what an individual is telling you. It's just that sometimes people don't have a lot of insight into their mental illness. Sometimes people don't have insight um, into kind of what they've experienced in their life. Sometimes they're really poor at talking about their life. I've had many individuals, unfortunately, that really don't do a very good job of telling me their life story. Um, and so that's when collateral information is, is, is very much needed. Also, unfortunately, sometimes individuals uh, overtly lie um, and want to look a certain way. Um, and so it's really nice to have all these extra records, uh, documentation to be able to kind of compare. Um, not saying uh, that all individuals lie, but again, uh, being able to do that uh, is very helpful. Um, one of the things that would go into a competency evaluation is a mental status exam. And so you would uh, basically comment on one's appearance and their behavior, their speech, you know, how they look as far as their affect, do they look like they're, you know, um, they're, they, they look okay, and, and, and is their affect okay, right? A uh, psychotic individual, they typically have what's called a flat affect, where they kind of, you know, uh, don't have a lot of facial uh, movement. Um, and then um, sometimes uh, individuals have a lot of uh, facial movement. So those are things you're going to want to comment on. Um, how they're thinking, what they're talking about, you know, what, what, what they're thinking about. Um, what is their intelligence or their cognitive abilities? And um, are they paranoid, you know? Um, an individual is working with extremely paranoid, so the camera's in the jail, which, it's, you know, this camera's in the jail, and said, you know, they're watching us, and, you know, what are they doing, and what's going on, and, and I, I felt very bad for him, but it, it showed a, a, an extreme form of uh, paranoia. Um, and then you're going to want to look at specific competency assessment, and this is where you kind of get to the meat of, is this person competent, or are they having some trouble um, uh, with respect to competency? Um, to be honest, I, I use a, just a semi-structured interview. I think that kind of gets to uh, what I needed to. But there's also formal tools. Uh, for instance, um, the uh, MacArthur um, uh, competence assessment is, is very helpful. I've used the uh, Exer uh, before, the Evaluation of Competency to Stand Trial Revised. It's another very helpful tool uh, to use. Uh, there's also something called the CASMR, mostly for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, also, we might need some psychological testing. Again, you're connecting the mental health symptoms with what uh, aspects of those mental health uh, symptoms are affecting competency. And so the first thing you have to figure out is, do they have a disorder? And if so, which one? And what are, what are the active symptoms? And so sometimes we need some personality testing, like a MMPI or a personality assessment inventory, some cognitive testing, like, um, like an intelligence test. Uh, and malingering measures, um, we provide, we do a lot of malingering um, uh, measures just to kind of see if an individual is being truthful and if their symptoms are genuine. And if they're not, we're working with them to kind of be more truthful uh, so we can move them forward uh, with their case. Um, so when you're kind of looking at competency uh, specifically, uh, one thing you're going to look at is the rational understanding of the proceedings. And so you ask about their charges and whether there are potential penalties, you know, is it serious or not? You know, if a person has a high level felony and they're like, oh, it's not serious, it's not a big deal, it'll be all right. Well, that's not showing a good rational understanding of what's, what's in front of them. You know, um, some might say they're just kind of minimizing things, but that has to be kind of looked at more and, and more questions have to be asked. Uh, they also have to kind of get a sense of, do they understand their meaning of the charges? Like you ask questions such as, what are they saying you did? Or, um, what, are they, uh, or, or what do you think happened? You know, what is your understanding of, of what happened? Um, you also want to kind of probe for how they want to handle the case. Now, this depends. You know, if it's a state where they can incriminate themselves, you have to be very careful about that last, uh, uh, those last questions and also this one. Um, so you have to you know, kind of dance around some of those things to make sure they don't incriminate themselves. Um, and so you're going to want to probe for uh, the um, the reason uh, for taking a plea, if that's what they're going to, if that's what they want to, uh, how, how they want to proceed. Can't tell you how many individuals say, "Oh, they're just going to drop the charges." And I said, "Well, that's not a strategy. That's that, you're praying for that. And that's great. You know, that, that's excellent. Um, but what's your strategy? What are you going to do? You have a menu of options in the legal system. What are you thinking?" Um, and so those are some of the ways to get to some of those questions. Um, how do you get to the facts, right? Um, you know, you ask, who's in a courtroom? You know, most people, I've had extremely psychotic individuals tell me, a judge, a DA, a, you know, a 
defense uh, counsel, defendant, jury, court reporter, stenographer, all that. Um, extremely psychotic, and so they will tell me that. So, um, you know, th those are some of the things you want to ask for. Uh, there are different plea options. You know, um, what's a plea bargain? You know, uh, a trial process. And you want to see if they understand that it's an adversarial thing, right? Um, one of the ways I ask that question is to say, if the DA came in right now and wanted to speak with you about your case, do you think it'd be a good idea to just talk with the DA? And if they say, yeah, sure, why not? Um, that's showing me they're not understanding that adversarial nature where that DA can use anything they say against them in court. Um, so I'd ask more questions if that were the case, if they said that. Um, as far as courtroom behavior, there's, there's, a, there's a few ways of getting at that. One is to kind of just see what their behavior is like. Um, if they're um, uh, acting up, in, in, you know, if it's a setting where you're able to, to, to see them, uh, like a program like I'm in, um, you get to see, you know, are they acting up a lot? Are they complying with staff directions? Are they um, able to kind of maintain their behavior? Um, also, you know, uh, how are they dressed? You know, uh, it depends if it's an outpatient or an inpatient evaluation, if they're in the jail, it's a little bit different. They're going to be dressed in, in jail attire, but hey, are they, you know, well-groomed? Are they going to be able to groom themselves and, and look appropriate for court? Um, can they pay attention and remember information? Um, are they making reasonable decisions uh, to all the questions uh, that you're asking them? Um, and can they control their impulses? Uh, I've had many individuals who looked really good. Their facts were great. They had some good rationalizations, but they're really irritable. And at times, they kind of lost their cool to the point where I don't know if they'll be able to handle a, a, a legal situation where a witness would say something about them that they didn't like or that the uh, DA will say something about them they don't like. If they're going to have an outburst in court, well, then that's going to affect their case. Uh, and, and that doesn't, that, that goes to the issue of competency right there. Um, again, you know, are they, uh, what's their decision making like? You know, are they able to testify appropriately if that's something that they're thinking about doing? Um, and so if an individual is determined to be uh, incompetent to proceed, that is made by a judge. No matter how good an evaluator is, they're only providing an opinion to the court. They're helping the court out. Ultimately, a judge would rule that they're incompetent to proceed, and they're sent for inpatient or outpatient restoration. Um, outpatient would look like, you know, they go to some groups during the week, uh, maybe meet with an individual counselor. It kind of depends on the setup. Inpatient would be more like where I work, um, and it would be round, almost round the clock uh, type of a restoration. Traditionally in the United States, most people go to the hospital. They go to what's called the state hospital, uh, and they get competency restoration. In the state of Colorado, it got so intense, so many people needing it, and so many federal lawsuits because of the wait list that they had to open up my program, which went from 22 beds to actually 52 beds and, and probably counting. Um, because of uh, the need uh, for an individual um, to uh, have to go through the restoration uh, process, and so many individuals, they set up programs uh, like mine um, in other states as well, uh, jail-based competency restoration. Um, sometimes uh, people are sent to treatment pending an evaluation. And a lot of those individuals get very upset. Uh, I try to tell them uh, about it as kind of a good thing um, that, hey, look, the judge kind of threw you into, <laughs> into this uh, treatment program pending an evaluation for competency. Hey, why don't we make the best of it? And, learn what you need to learn and, and, and kind of uh, go through the program. That way, when the evaluator comes from the state, you know, you'll, you'll be more ready. And so hopefully, uh, that's a way to kind of turn that um, to, to be a little bit better as far as a relationship there. Um, so anyway, an individual, let's say it's, you know, they're determined to be incompetent to proceed, uh, they would go to restoration. All right. And you might ask, what do you do with an individual who doesn't, you know, isn't able to rationalize well or doesn't understand the court system, right? And so the most important thing to do is to find out what are the symptoms that are affecting their ability to become competent and to treat those symptoms. And so uh, to be able to uh, treat those symptoms, uh, you have to first find out you know, what, they, what they have, right? Um, but let's say it's psychosis, all right? And so um, you know, one of the frontline uh, uh, ways to treat psychosis is medication, unfortunately, which is how it is. Um, and I can't tell you how many people I've seen who are in such rough shape. They come in very psychotic, uh, delusional, hallucinations, um, disorganized speech. I can't really understand what they're talking about. Um, they're making very loose connections, such as they're, they're saying 
they call it, the official term for it is nonsensical, but meaning I, I, I can't understand what they even mean. Um, but, you know, given that the right medication, a really good forensic psychiatrist, these, uh, these individuals tend to improve. And for the majority of indi individuals I see, it doesn't take them very long to become competent. Um, you know, our average stay, I think, right now is about 40, 41 days, which, is, which isn't too bad in the world of competency. Um, okay. And then you can read a little bit more on psychosis. Um, and here's some individual, uh, it's, it's some information about uh, how long can they stay in competency restoration. Um, in 1972, yeah, Jackson v. Indiana, a uh, Supreme Court said that, you know, a person can't just be in competency restoration their whole life. You know, if they got a misdemeanor charge, they can't, they can't be in restoration, um, you know, for an indefinite amount of time. It's got to be uh, at the max, all right? And I think that goes to the cruel and unusual punishment, a you know, constitutional issue. So what's the goal? Uh, the goal is to restore the individual to competency. Um, it could be psychotropic medication, competency groups, um, recovery programs, and, and most people restore to competency uh, within six months. Um, and uh, we teach factual information, uh, we guide in their understanding of the case. Um, you know, the mental health professionals that work in a program like this, they're, they're not a, um, a lawyer, that's not their job. Their job is to just kind of help facilitate uh, an individual's understanding about the legal system and to challenge uh, some of those assumptions they make that don't sound very rational, uh, to do it in a therapeutic way. It's very challenging, as you might imagine. Um, and so as far as restoration, you want to focus on medication compliance. It's really one of our biggest um, issues, uh, to be honest, and the more uh, that we can to um, engage in that work and for the individual to be compliant with medication the more likely they are to, to become competent. Um, and that, that exposure to competency material is daily in a program like ours. Um, they get a competency group every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, they have a packet. They have an individual counselor that meets with them at least three times a week. So they're really kind of going at studying uh, what, what the legal system is like. Um, they do mock courts. Uh, staff members do role plays, you know, things like that. Psychiatric nurses might be the one that is the most helpful. Um, a psychiatric nurse I work with has done wonders. Uh, in fact, there are some individuals who won't meet with any staff, but will only meet with the psychiatric nurse. And through that psychiatric nurse, that bond, uh, they've been able to kind of trickle in some of that competency-related knowledge that they need and kind of helping them along as far as their treatment. Um, you can read a little bit more about uh, recovery programs, but that's, you know, recovery from mental illness is one of the big things that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and, and just so you know, in a program like ours, we're, um, as a treatment team, we review their condition and their barriers and kind of try to move them forward, um, try to get them ready uh, to go back to court. You know, the goal is to restore them as quickly as possible. Um, and I always tell an individual when they come into the program that, I want you to go back to court and fight your case as soon as possible, but let's, let's kind of help you. Let's, let's get you there. Um, and uh, client-centered uh, approaches, um, like basically trying to meet them where they're at and just, you know, thinking of them as a, as a human being and, and treating them like a human being. Um, and and uh, motivational interviewing, which is a technique, if you haven't heard, of trying to figure out where they're at and how to move them forward uh, in a way that builds their motivation. To, uh, to, to change uh, whatever their behavior is. Um, and so overall, um, a program like ours, we're going to take an individual who has been deemed incompetent to proceed. Uh, we're going to figure out what we need to do. Uh, we're going to meet as a treatment team, the psychiatrist, psychiatric nurse, psychologist, social worker, other mental health professionals, uh, peer support specialist, um, and maybe some other uh, individuals who are helpful, like a reentry specialist. And uh, we figure out what an individual needs, how we, how we can move them forward, and get them prepared for that forensic evaluation so that the next time uh, the evaluator comes, they feel that they're ready to continue with court. Um, and, um, you know, just, just to speak personally about it, uh, the, these are individuals who are, a lot of them are very sick. Um, they have a lot of very complex, uh, serious uh, mental illness. Uh, traumatic brain injuries, schizophrenia, other forms of psychosis, bipolar disorder, sometimes bipolar with psychotic features, um, and, and other cognitive related issues like intellectual disabilities. And um, a lot of these individuals are homeless. And unfortunately, I would say a majority of individuals that we treat uh, were on the street you know, before that. It's very sad. Um, what's very rewarding is that we help these individuals move forward and get better. 
And uh, just to share like a quick story as we're as we're as I'm kind of finishing up my part, um, I had an individual I was working with. Uh, they were at the point where I could barely understand what he was trying to convey to me. Um, he knew that I couldn't understand, so he had a little bit of insight. Um, and I told him, stick with it, trust me, let's move you forward, and and we're gonna we're gonna you know I promise I you know I won't stop working with you. Um, and this individual went from I could barely understand him to remembering that he had a, a significant other that he hasn't he lost contact with being homeless and on methamphetamine and, and completely uh, psychotic um, touch base with this relative their relative said that they can stay with uh, them as soon as he was ready to you know uh, be done with his case and everything like that and his responsibilities um, had a job for him lined up uh, and he was just went from uh, being completely psychotic to an individual who was a human being, very smart uh, guy who helped other people on the unit, um, became uh, competent to proceed according to this uh, to the state evaluator and then ultimately the judge, and is moving on with their case uh, currently. Um, these are the success stories. These are the reasons why we do the work we do. Um, if you ever choose to be in a career like this, uh, you'll find a lot of the times it's not that successful, that there are a lot of hardships. Um, but that the successful cases are the things that kind of keep you going. Um, and so it's been very rewarding for me if it's anything that you all are interested in, the forensic side, which you're evaluating individuals' competency, or the treatment side, where they come into a treatment program and um, you know, get help. Um, there's a lot of different jobs popping up um, that I've noticed in these jail-based competency restoration programs uh, for individuals with their doctorates, with a master's, um, with bachelor's. Um, so. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there, there's a big need. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to Dr. Uh, Penn um, for, uh, um, for the next part. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Waxman. Uh, I'm sure we have plenty of, uh, of questions. And uh, we can we can address those questions uh, right after I I talk for just a little bit. I want to go over the uh, the program here. Uh, give me just a second to share my screen. Sorry, let me go ahead and give me one second here. Okay, there we go. Okay, hi everybody. Okay, so presumably you can see my screen as well, is that right? Okay. Great. All right, so I want to talk just a little bit about the Masters in Forensic Psychology program. Dr. Waxman, uh, you know, great presentation. It actually goes over a lot of this stuff in uh, some, of the, some of the courses he, he teaches. He teaches two general courses in our in our program uh, and also teaches uh, the capstone as well so we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Waxman uh, working with us and also in the criminal justice program here at Nova uh, the website has a ton of information about the program really easy just nova.edu forward slash MSFP masters master in science and forensic psychology so if you have any questions have any sort of want to learn more about the program get some material Go, go there. You'll you'll uh, you'll get some uh, some uh, insight. It's a, a 36 credit program, which means there's three hours a, a class, right? Three credit hours a class, so 12 uh, courses. Most students uh, complete it in about two years, but you can, uh, if you're taking two classes a term, three terms a year, six terms in total, you're finishing in about two years. Some students take a little bit longer. 
It's a program started, it's been about around for about five years. And you know, in the program, you get expertise about the intersection between psychology and the legal world, really the, the kind of stuff that Dr. Waxman is talking about. So how for, uh, forensic psychology is used and learn about it in a variety of contexts, variety of, of professional contexts uh, specifically. It's an online program and it's uh, non-clinical. So uh, it's really for working professionals who want to integrate knowledge uh, about forensic psychology, about psychology really, uh, in, uh, into their uh, job responsibilities and into uh, their competencies and what they do. The program, obviously, because it's online, uh, it's uh, flexible in terms of location. You can really be anywhere. We have students all over the United States, really all, all over the world, and also in terms of time. We have some uh, synchronous uh, chats, meaning uh, chats like this, some of the profess that the professors do. They're mostly offered in the evening, so really most of our students work, and it, it allows our students to work and to support themselves. And, and uh, so it's really a job, it's a really a program for working professionals uh, to a large degree. Uh, you know, law enforcement, corrections, these areas are, are areas that are, that are growing substantially and students on our uh, program, they uh, specialize specifically in law, in uh, mental health or other health uh, services and they want to work in the forensic area or really be able to bring psychology to their work. They might work also in a variety of other settings, uh, dependency uh, within the uh, within the uh, uh, law enforcement areas, uh, within the uh, correctional uh, settings. Um, so it, it just depends. But uh, essentially, you want to have a full fuller understanding of how psychology and what psychology can bring uh, to to their setting, or they want to get a job in that kind of setting. And uh, majority of our graduates will. Uh, begin or continue their careers in an area where psychology and the criminal justice system intersects in some way. And so that's uh, the courts, law enforcement, criminal justice, national security, and other areas, related uh, areas, as I mentioned before. People come into the program to develop their careers, to become more eligible for uh, senior level positions, to get salary increases. And also, uh, we have some people who uh, will then come into the into a doctoral program, will apply to a doctoral program, so they, they get a master's degree in order to become more competitive for a doctor's doctoral program. And our, our program, our master's program, actually satisfies the prerequisites for our NSU clinical psychology program. So there's some requirements in order to apply to the uh, NSU clinical psychology, PhD, and PsyD programs. The, uh, this master's degree actually satisfies the prerequisites to be able to apply. So that's helpful for folks who have undergrads in other settings and other uh, topics and other areas. So, you know, economic, non-psychology areas, right, because there's some uh, psychology classes that are required. There's some uh, foundational courses, eight foundational courses, so 24 credits. Uh, I'll list them real quick. So we have an intro class, psychopathology class, a research uh, class, a methods and tools. Methods and tools actually one of the classes that Dr. Waxman teaches. I teach the evaluation, the research class, the last class listed there. Uh, the uh, uh, other four uh, of the core A classes, ethics, uh, there's an ethics class, uh, best practices for the mentally ill and who are involved with the criminal justice system, uh, the gender violence class, and the communication skills, tools, and expert witness testimony. Then uh, there are uh, uh, two general uh, concentrations, there are two concentrations you can pick from, uh, forensic psychology and the legal system, and uh, that's, that has four electives, uh, three which you, you, can, you uh, can pick from. Let, let me kind of explain that. So uh, three of the electives are going to be uh, uh, different courses that you might be interested in that are specific to this concentration, and then one relates to the capstone. Everyone needs to do a capstone. So it's like the last class that you take. And actually, Dr. Waxman also helps out with, with some of the students there who take a capstone. And you work one-on-one -on -one with one of the faculty in either doing a thesis, a master's thesis, or a field placement. So one of those two options. So that's one of the classes of the four. Then uh, three, you pick from, from a menu of, of different uh, classes that are focused in on your particular interests. So for this uh, track, for uh, track one, 
we would have uh, psychology issues uh, in dependency and family law, therapeutic jurisprudence, behavior, behavioral uh, criminology. These are a couple uh, examples. Then we have a tra the other track, right, which is forensic psychology uh, for mental health workers, first, uh, re first responders and disaster teams. Uh, this also, same thing, you know, four, four electives and the capstone, so you really have three electives that you can pick from. Uh, some examples, suicide prevention and crisis intervention skills, trauma-informed assessment and intervention, and police psychology. So pretty neat classes and uh, focusing in on uh, uh, areas that you're interested in. There's, there's, there's some more courses as well uh, uh, that you can choose from for both areas. Again, the capstone, either way, you go field uh, experience or thesis. If you definitely want to go on or if you're thinking about going on, to, uh, to get additional study, let's say getting a, a PsyD, PhD, additional graduate work, it's a good idea to do the thesis, the master's thesis. Uh, otherwise, you can do the, the field experience. We have you know, incredible faculty teaching our, our courses. They're, some are, are local at the university. Some are all over the you know, United States, just like Dr. Waxman, who's in, in the, the Denver area. Uh, full-time adjuncts, we have forensic psychologists, judges, attorneys, working in the courts, correctional assessment, treatment areas, competency restoration, Dr. Waxman, uh, expert witnesses, private practice, and higher education. We have a former uh, FBI uh, a lead uh, in, uh, in forensics. Uh, so we have some, some incredible faculty that you can, you can learn from. The, the courses are all offered online. We use Blackboard to teach the courses and also GoToMeeting, which is kind of like what we're using right now. We're using GoToTraining. It's very similar. Um, and uh, we have readings, different materials uh, that, are, that are posted that you need to, to read as well, texts, books, uh, discussion boards that you'll participate in, uh, you know, regular chats through the uh, GoToMeeting uh, tool assignments that are required, and then also exams. So these are all a part of how you learn, how you learn within the, the various courses. People usually take six credits per term, like I, I, I mentioned before. So it's two classes a term, mostly in the evening. So it's very, it's very workable for someone who has a, a job, something that's very, very plausible in terms of uh, completing it within two years, but also at a pace that's not, uh, that won't kill you. Uh, so fall, winter, and summer, so three terms a year, and you can take up to five years to uh, complete it. So if you have questions about the curriculum, about the program, go to the website. You can get information there. Tons of information there um, is, uh, is available. You could also reach out to me uh, anytime, uh, pan at nova.edu, which is P-A-N-N -N at nova.edu, so you can, if you have any questions, or you can contact me in my office. Um, does anyone have any questions about the curriculum or about the program? Okay, if you do, you can jump on in. Uh, okay, so we're going to go ahead and take questions from here. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Greg, you're going to talk real quick about applying for the program as well? Yes, I will be doing that right now. Okay, great. So hello everyone. Um, we just had this really fantastic uh, presentation on uh, forensic psychology. Um, we are hopeful that uh, you enjoyed the presentation. My part of this presentation is just to walk you through the application process and also to talk to you about uh, affordability, how to finance your graduate education. My presentation really is, consists of screenshots from our website. As Dr. Pan said, really the best way, or after our presentation, another great way of learning about our program uh, is to visit us online. So what you should know is that we welcome applications to our master's program. 
Um, we would like you to complete our application. Uh, we have an online application process that is very simple. Uh, it takes around 20 to 30 minutes to complete our online application. What you're seeing on the screen is the first page of the process of completing the online application. So you would create your profile, your graduate profile. Um, the next thing you would do is at the end of the process, um, you're required to submit a processing fee or application fee of $50. We would like you to submit two letters of recommendation. Um, these letters of recommendation are primarily from um, academic individuals. So if you're currently uh, in college, uh, we would like members of your faculty to actually submit the letters. Or if you're working in the field, you have the opportunity of submitting letters of recommendation from your supervisors. What we're looking for is information that will tell us what kind of graduate student you would be. We would like you to submit your academic transcripts. This is a way for us to see your academic history. A common question we get asked is if I attended the community college uh, and I earned my degree from uh, a university, may I only submit my university transcript. Um, for admission to our program, we require that you are required to submit transcripts from all the schools that you've attended. Um, so if you've earned a bachelor's degree, all the schools where you've uh, taken courses as part of the bachelor's degree, uh, you must send transcripts to us. As well as if you've earned a graduate degree, we require that you submit uh, the transcript as well. So we'll have your information about your academic background. We'll have letters of recommendation from your professors or your supervisor. But we would like to know why you're interested in this program. Uh, and so we'd like you to submit a personal statement or an essay telling us about your professional goals. Um, essentially, how do you assess your ability to do well within this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, profession or this uh, program? Uh, and so we'd like you to submit this as part of the application. Um, it has to be at least uh, 500 words long. Uh, and again, we want you to tell us truthfully and honestly why you're interested in this program. We welcome applications to this program. Um, students may start uh, in the fall semester. Um, which is in August, our winter semester, or as some schools call their summer term, uh, I'm sorry, their spring term, and our summer term, which starts in May. The deadline dates that are listed means that you must submit all the required documents on or before those dates. Students may also apply a year in advance. Um, if you know you would like to start a particular semester, you can go ahead and start the application process a year in advance. If you've noticed that during my presentation, I didn't speak about international applicants. Um, if you are uh, on a, a visa, an I-20, uh, the process is slightly different. So if you'd like me to explain that process, please feel free to contact me directly and I'm happy to explain that process. What you should know is that you will be working with our International Students and Scholars Office. The information pertaining to your application will be sent to our uh, Enrollment Processing Service, which is a centralized uh, service on our campus. You may also email or have your transcripts emailed to us to expedite the process. Um, if you have any questions about the enrollment process, please feel free to contact us. We have both a local number and a toll-free number, and you may also send, uh, send us an email. The next step in my presentation is to talk about affordability. Pursuing a graduate education is very similar to pursuing an undergraduate education. And so many of the things I'll be talking about, you will, if you're an undergraduate student, um, you will recognize as something, as things that you would have done as part of the undergraduate process. We have an entire department at this university that are um, responsible for working with students as they go through this process. Um, 
everything that I'm about to say is from their website. So you may visit them at nova.edu forward slash financial aid. The offices call our, our Office of Student Financial Assistance. What you should know is that we allow students or prospective students to actually search for scholarships. So we have uh, scholarships that are located on campus, institutional scholarships, uh, and scholarships that are located uh, in uh, our community. Um, and so those scholarships are listed. So again, whether you are a prospective student or a current student, um, you may actually go to that website and actually search for scholarships. Um, as you can see, we have both graduate institutional scholarships and external scholarships. We also provide students with loan information. So federal loans um, for some students, that is a part of their financial aid packet. So what we, record, uh, what we do is that we talk to students about the process of applying for federal loans. For individuals who are of a veteran status, we do have uh, individuals on our campus to help you with that process, uh, to explain to you how you can apply um, for loans as part of uh, your veteran status. Graduate students at our institutions have the ability to actually work on campus. Um, they may either work by being a federal student work study uh, in which as part of the financial aid process, dollars are assigned to you and throughout the semester you are employed and you earn those dollars or you can just be employed by a particular department on campus uh, for clerical or other kinds of work. If there is a gap in terms of the funding that you have for your education uh, and the cost of the education, um, we provide uh, payment options for students uh, that will help them uh, pay for their tuition. Uh, and again, this is a process where you would contact us and we would work with you uh, on this process. The entire process, though, starts with you completing the free application for federal student aid, which is very similar to or is actually the same as you did as an undergraduate student. Um, you would also get your federal student aid ID. Uh, and that ID is, again, something you will need as you start the financial aid process. Again, we have an entire department devoted to helping you with this process. You may visit us on campus uh, on our Fort Lauderdale Davy location. You may call us. We have both a local number and a toll-free number. Or you may visit us online at um, nova.edu forward slash financial aid. So with that said, I will share the screen back to Dr. Pan um, so that he can answer uh, any questions about this process. And I do have several questions to ask both our presenters. Gentlemen, are you there? Yes. Yep, I'm here. Okay. So we do have a question for Dr. Waxman. Could he explain more about how someone can have a mental illness and be competent to stand trial? Sure. Uh, can everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, how an individual can have a mental illness and stand trial? Yes. Okay, great. So. And that happens uh, quite a bit in our program where individuals still continue to have mental illness and uh, stand trial. And there's also individuals who have been assessed uh, to, uh, for, for, for their, uh, with respect to their competency and have been deemed competent to proceed and the evaluator uh, feels that they're competent to proceed. The uh, big reason uh, why that occurs is that their mental health symptoms are not affecting their ability to factually understand the system, to rationally understand the system, and to be able to assist their attorney and to assist their own defense. And so just to kind of give you an example, an individual who has uh, schizophrenia, um, let's say it's managed well, but they still uh, hear voices, uh, which just happened before that I've, uh, I've, been, I've worked with. 
uh, those voices don't interfere uh, with their ability to concentrate or understand their attorney. Um, they have a very rational sense of how they want to proceed in their case. And they understand the facts of the legal system. Um, while the voices are there, they're, they're managed, uh, and the person uh, doesn't pay uh, enough attention to them for it to affect their concentration abilities. Um, so that's a kind of a little bit more of an extreme example, but but it's but it's possible. And I have worked with people who had that uh, happen for them. Um, in in your capacity, do you work more with families, state officials, um, law enforcement? Um, so in my capacity, I'm working mostly with the clients themselves. Occasionally, I work with their attorney uh, in order to understand what about their symptoms is affecting their ability to work with you. Um, most attorneys are, are receptive to that. Some attorneys don't feel like it's their role to uh, engage in the competency um, just because they want to protect their client as much as possible. So I understand that there's a legal reason for that. Um, so I, I do work a lot with the public defenders or the defense attorneys. Uh, law enforcement, I wouldn't work with in that capacity. I work with maybe doing a forensic evaluation or something like that on, uh, you know, on the side, not, not, not with competency restoration. Uh, sometimes we work with families, and that's, that's the most helpful. I'm working, for instance, with an individual now whose aunt is extremely um, supportive and helpful, and it's really helping this individual uh, get through competency because there's a goal there to kind of get back with their aunt and somebody who's supportive. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the individuals we work with, their families really aren't very supportive. Um, they've burnt some some bridges or they unfortunately just don't have a lot of uh, family uh, to rely on. Um, and so that, that's typically uh, the people that we rely on. Obviously, working in a team approach, you rely on your, the other staff members. So for instance, as a psychologist, I'm working very closely with the social worker uh, the psychiatric nurse and the psychiatrist to make sure that we're figuring out what exactly we need to work on in order to get this individual ready to go back to court. Dr. Waxman, what happens when, when someone does not get uh, their competency restored? You know, they've uh, presumably they've been accused of, uh, it, these are, are felony cases, right? Uh, not always. Sometimes we have uh, st uh, strict misdemeanor cases, which I uh, know it's surprising, <laughs> uh, but Colorado does that. Huh. Okay. Well, so in a case of, let's say, a seriously, you know, felony, something like that, uh, and the person does not have their competency restored or it just takes, you know, just sort of indefinite, it seems, what happens? And I guess that, that it seems to me that probably happens sometimes, right? Because there's some people with psychotic disorders who are non-responsive to uh, uh, or minimally responsive to, to medication, um, right? Sure, yeah, definitely. Um, and that's that's our biggest battles is the individuals who are not restoring well, uh, individuals over six months. Um, we kind of look at the six month uh, time frame as a diminishing returns, except if an individual is extremely psychotic and the psychiatrist is working really hard on like adjusting meds over time. Uh, that's about the only reason why that may take longer than six months. But anyway, that's kind of been a benchmark, at least in our program. Um, it goes back to that Jackson v. Indiana where you can't keep an individual in competency restoration longer than you know, pretty much like their max charge, you know, really kind of, it's on the judge at that point to kind of decide what's fair. Um, and so if you're talking about a serious felony, I mean, if they're looking at, say, a 12-year max, um, technically they could be uh, sent to the state hospital. They, they wouldn't be in our program very long. I'd say after a year or two in our program, they were definitely going to be sent to the state hospital, uh, which can kind of deal with more severe issues like that. Um, but anyway, uh, they could technically be held for a lot, much longer period of time. Uh, typically, if their defense attorney is uh, good, uh, they're going to bring up uh, what's called restorability. And what, what happens at that point is that a judge could rule that an individual is permanently incompetent to proceed. And at that point, uh, a judge will kind of determine how long that, that individual is going to stay in like a hospital or maybe they'll kind of rely on the hospital staff to let them know when an individual is safe for society. The problem with that is that DAs don't like it very much because it, in their mind, it gives them a kind of a free pass for the rest of their life. Uh, so anytime they commit any other crimes, they've already been deemed permanently incompetent to proceed, which is kind of like a, in their mind, I get a jail free card, although I, I would not look at it that way. Um, and so what, what you'll often see happening, at least in our program, is that the DA will drop the charges, um, even for very serious felonies, you'd be surprised. But that takes a very long time. And the more serious the felony, the less likely that's going to happen, and it might even kind of fight it to the end uh, for it to be PITP. Are there some other cases when where the uh, that individual will stay in the state hospital without charge? I mean, without uh, being convicted, obviously, 
for yeah. uh, for for you know decades or for multiple years? Uh, yeah. what, is, what does that look like? Yeah, it could be quite a long time. It really, again, it kind of depends on the seriousness of the crime. Um, it depends on uh, the evaluations. Um, you know, if the person is is, is a major risk. Um, you know, if their uh, future risk of dangerousness is going to start to kind of uh, get looked at. Um, and ultimately, a judge rules on uh, those kinds of things, uh, obviously with help from you know, evaluations from uh, state evaluators as well as treatment providers and these uh, different programs, including the state hospital. But uh, there was a time when they would just keep individuals indefinitely uh, for like uh, much longer than they would have served uh, at their max penalty. Uh, but again, in that um, Supreme Court case, Jackson v. Indiana, they can't keep them for longer than their max charge, uh, basically. Right. Uh, very interesting. There was another question about personality disorders affecting competency. Uh, do generally, yeah, do personality disorders generally affect competency? Yeah, that's that's a tricky one. Um, so you know, when it comes to just pure personality disorders, now there's a lot of individuals who we're working with who have personality disorders and what they used to call access one. Now you know, just kind of call clinical disorders like say bipolar or schizophrenia, but they kind of have both. Uh, so it makes it even more complicated. Um, but if it's just kind of a clean personality disorder, like say um, uh, antisocial personality disorder, that, that is pro that's, that's not enough for an individual, at least in the state of Colorado and, and probably many other states, um, to be uh, deemed incompetent to proceed. So for instance, we had an individual who was very, uh, definitely an antisocial personality uh, diagnosis, didn't really have any other uh, 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 issues. He just did not want to engage in our program. He wouldn't go to treatment. Uh, he wouldn't uh, meet with the counselor. Uh, he was very rude. We tried to do everything. We tried to connect family. I and mean, he told us all kinds of profanities that he could not imagine. Um, and so at the end, the state evaluator, based on the information that they saw, felt like the individual, it wasn't an ability issue. It was a willingness. And, and so because it's a willingness issue, they said the person's competent. They just need to learn how to get along uh, with their attorney and, and, and be active. Um, you know, some people would, would disagree and say that, you know, something like a personality disorder is, you know, interferes with their ability to kind of work with their attorney and it's a genuine, um, you know, ingrained psychological disorder. But, you know, it kind of just depends on your perspective. But the law perspective is that a personality disorder wouldn't be enough. Now, if you go into other personality disorders, for instance, like borderline personality disorder where individual has a difficult time being able to manage their emotions, um, you know, the, the, uh, they have a, a difficult time with relationships, um, you would see that that would be more likely the case that it would also kind of bleed into uh, other clinical disorders, uh, such as, say, depression um, or uh, having emotional uh, instability. Um, and then the evaluator might say that some of those factors are, are playing into it as well and are, is affecting their ability to be competent to proceed. But it gets tricky when it's personality disorders. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, what, what a great session. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you uh, for the presentation, Dr. Chad Waxman. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Greg, uh, anything else uh, before we wrap up? I think it's uh, basically 7 o'clock right now. So, yeah. Um, we do welcome any questions, even though we are ending this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. We'll post um, video as well, right? Exactly. Our video, this session has been recorded uh, and will be on our website uh, in around 10 days. So you'll okay. have the ability of watching this at another time. Yeah, and we've, we've had other uh, webinars as well, really interesting topics in forensic psychology that are on there that are posted already and we'll have ongoing webinars as well. So keep keep uh, staying stay in touch, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could also watch those uh, through the NOVA uh, website, through the YouTube channel, right, uh, right, Greg? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And um, you have a great evening. All right, thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.